Even in the dead of night, there is something very special about picking up an Aston Martin from the factory in Warwickshire. Even better if you're picking up two. Walking to the exit, you feel like you're being scrutinised by their silent brethren. The headlights watching you out of the door. The big security gate peels back, you make your escape, and then it's time to get comfortable for a couple of hours. Settle in and enjoy your surroundings. At this time of year, a long drive is followed inevitably by a jet wash, sluicing away the road grime and revealing the beautiful shapes in you in the daylight. And although the shapes appear similar, the reason we've brought them together is that they respectively represent Aston Martin's past and Aston Martin's future. First up, the old guard, the 565 brake horsepower, 205 mile an hour V12 Vantage S manual. Let's not beat about the bush. I absolutely adore this car. It is truly wonderful. That naturally aspirated V12. Such perfect balance really from this front engine, rear drive Vantage chassis, hydraulically power assisted steering, and a manual box. Of course, when it first came out, the V12 Vantage, it had a manual gearbox, but that was a six speed. And when they improved it, for the S, uh, it became much less nose heavy and the balance was just much better. But they gave it the paddle shift, which it just wasn't brilliant. It was a characterful paddle shift, perhaps, is the best way of describing it. Anyway, now they've brought back a manual, and this time it's a seven speed. Unlike the Porsche seven speed, this is a dog leg first, so it's across and back for first and then you're into the normal H pattern, which sort of makes much more sense, I think, in a, in a way. It's much more traditional, certainly. The shift from first to second is perhaps a little tricky because it's, it's quite a narrow shift across the box, but apart from that, it's lovely. I really like it. This is an absolutely fantastic driving road. It's the Butter Tubs Pass, which is in, as they call it, God's own country, Yorkshire. The Dales, to be precise, rather than the, the Moors and pretty bumpy, but love all the elevation changes. The good sight lines. Jeremy would get extremely annoyed in summer because it gets used by lots of cyclists, but I'm happy to share the road. It really feels like Aston has actually hit something of a sweet spot in recent years with these cars. I love the N430 as well, but it's a bit like that person that was sort of their fashion sense was stuck in the 70s and then suddenly they become trendy again because flares are back in the shops. Aston, I guess it hasn't really updated any of its models in the last few years and has been stuck with, let's face it, frankly, old technology. It's almost lucked into the whole scene where you have cars like the 911R being popular because they have naturally aspirated engines and they've stepped away from PDK and put manual gearboxes back into it and you find Aston going, oh, Yes, no, no, we're, we're on board with that, totally, absolutely. But in reality, yes, this car is a bit old fashioned. It's, it's, it's very analog. I like it, but for customers, they want something newer. And that's where the DB11 comes in. Whereas Yorkshire felt like a nice, manageable place to get to in the Vantage, the DB11 is the sort of car that you can cover really big distances in. It's a GT. So we left the old car behind and kept heading north. We stopped, we filled up, we kept going. It got dark, we pushed on. The DB11 is just a great car to cover ground in. All of which meant that the following morning, we woke up in Scotland.
Now, I know that this is not obviously a straight comparison. The Vantage is very different to the DB9, which is what the DB11 is replacing, but this is a comparison between old Aston Martin and new Aston Martin, and as soon as you get into this car, it feels like a whole new generation. From the moment you start the DB11, you know it's different. There's no emotion control unit to slot into the dash for a start. Ignore for a second the dubious blue, white and red colour scheme and the carbon fibre inserts that look as though they belong in a kitchen worktop, and you'll see a wonderfully comfortable driving environment with great seats, modern TFT displays in place of the analogue dials, and a very modern looking steering wheel. Perhaps even more importantly, whereas the old sat-nav system was so antiquated that you might as well have used a map, there is now slick, reliable Mercedes technology hiding in plain sight. Although it's not so fashionable these days, I even like the fixed position aluminium paddles with their Ferrari-like long throw to control the smooth 8-speed ZF Auto. There's something else rather Ferrari about this car and that's the steering, which is much, much quicker. Before, if you wanted to change any of the settings in the car, you had to sort of reach slightly like, awkwardly sort of in front of the manual gear lever down here, it's like Porsche used to be. If you wanted to turn the traction control off, it was over there, and you had to sort of hold it for five seconds, or sport mode, or change the dampers. Now, it's up here. There's a damper button here, and a sport button here, which is, well, just much more ergonomic, much more sensible. Another big change from the new generation of Aston Martin's obviously the engine, so we've gone from a 5.9 litre V12 down to a 5.2 litre V12, but there's the addition now of two turbochargers. It is slipperier than an eel in a soap factory up here in Scotland today, and you have to be so ginger on the throttle to avoid the rear tyres spinning up. Sometimes adding turbochargers can take away from the character of the engine in terms of its sound. It's a slightly different tone, but it still sounds like an Aston Martin. And curiously before as well, it used to the engines have always sounded better from the outside, much more surprisingly loud from the outside. And this is just the same. It feels loud, but not too loud in here. Stand outside though and it will scare small children. This is the first Aston to have its chassis honed by ex-Lotus guru Matt Becker. He's been tasked with making the next generation of cars much more dynamically distinct from each other. So, where a DB9 would have felt much closer in chassis set up to the Vantage, this has much longer suspension travel in those arches, giving it an almost lugubrious feeling over bigger bumps, and instilling much of that long journey GT capability. Interestingly, however, it's not totally isolated from the road like a pure mile muncher, the smaller bumps still being communicated so that when you do reach a good road, you have enough confidence to push hard. It might seem an odd matchup having that long travel suspension, the quick steering, but it somehow, it just works. And if you do turn everything off and go sideways, it makes the car actually very easy to catch. Perhaps the one area you might have difficulty convincing people that this really is a new Aston Martin is in the exterior design. It's not necessarily a bad thing because I don't think I've ever heard anyone in the last 20 years say, oh, a bit ugly that Aston, isn't it? I'm not sure the correspondent colour scheme of this car actually shows off the big coupe shape to best advantage, as it makes it look a little like a convertible. But I do like the overtones of the Mega Bucks 177 in its pinched waist and big rear arches. Oh, and as you can tell, I'm afraid we washed, and we washed, but we did give up cleaning it eventually. I rather like a dirty supercar. What you can see from the exterior now though is that Aston's really taken notice of aerodynamics. On the Vantage you just get a little sort of flick up on the boot and that's pretty much it in terms of aero. On the DB11 however you've got these sophisticated tunnels that run through the C pillars, ducting air so it then flips up and actually avoids the need for any sort of spoiler up at the rear. At the front too, you can see where it vents around the front arches with that beautiful detail that sort of is taken from the 177. It's really not an engine that you rev out. My word, it's fast. It's got so much grunt. <laughs> it's so fast. The DB11 is a seriously impressive car. 
and its ability to cover huge distances, yet still be entertaining when you reach your destination, it feels like Aston Martin has got the sporting GT concept absolutely nailed. Of course, the big question now is how Aston is going to replace the fabulous Vantage. All that communication and analogue connection that makes it such a wonderful sports car needs to be encapsulated in the next Mercedes-powered incarnation. I can't wait to pick one up from the factory and bring it back up here to put it to the test.